It's not just our tech-enabled world that runs by algorithm. Us meat machines, us humans, we one and all have our own programming, our deeply embedded rules that determine the decisions we make, the paths we walk, and who and how we show up in the world. Now, often the first path of growth and development is figuring out what our rules are, finding language for our own programming. The second part of growth and development is often unbugging the program and rewriting the maxims so you become the person you want to be rather than the person you once were. Now, here are three rules, three algorithms, three maxims that I bet you haven't considered, at least not fully. Number one, don't wait until you know who you are to get started. Don't wait until you know who you are to get started. Number two, learn to take a punch. And number three, the ordinary plus extra attention equals the extraordinary. Now, each one of those is from a different Austin Cleon book. Don't wait until you know who you are to get started. That's number two from his breakout hit, Steal Like an Artist. Learn to take a punch is number eight from Show Your Work. And the ordinary plus extra attention equals the extraordinary is number five in the third book of the trilogy, Keep Going. Now, I had 30 Austin Cleon rules to pick from. Each book has 10 maxims. But I picked these three for you because I know one of them was just what you needed to hear. And of course, I'm curious which one it was it that really struck the chord for you. The rule I like, creativity is subtraction. That's from Steel Like an Artist, and I cunningly removed it. I subtracted it from the list of three that I offered you earlier on. Welcome to Two Pages with MBS, the podcast where brilliant people read the best two pages from a favorite book, a book that has moved them, a book that has shaped them. Now, this is the first episode back after a bit of a redesign. Now, the episodes stay the same. Brilliant people, two pages, deep conversation. But as you may know, now they'll come every two weeks. What's new is that there's a Substack newsletter, two pages with the word TWO, two pages with mbs.substack.com for my short essay and to get notice of a new episode every two weeks. Members also get access to transcripts and the occasional MBS solo episode where I read and discuss two pages from books that have moved and shaped me. There's also a dedicated YouTube channel. Now, each episode, like this one with Austin, will have two clips on the YouTube channel, one of the whole pod and one just of the guest reading the two pages. Now, all the links for all of this are in the show notes. And of course, I just want to say thank you again for your ongoing support and encouragement, reviews, nice notes, nice emails, all of that. I really do appreciate it. So now, on with the pod. I love all of Austin Kleon's books. In fact, when I start writing a book, one of my books, in the very first moments when I'm imagining the shape and the feel and the the vibe, I go to Austin's work and ask myself, WWAD, what would Austin do? His books are short, wise, beautiful, artistic, and unique. Also, and this is part of their genius, it's almost impossible not to finish reading them once you've started. One of my favorite cartoonists is Ernie Bushmiller, who did um, Nancy. And he famously said, you know, I want Nancy to be easier to read than to not read. <laughs> and that's like what I go for from my books. I like I want it to be easier to just keep reading than to not read. it. That sounds so simple. And yet it's so hard to pull off. That's one reason why I write short books. I mean, my design philosophy is, what's the least I can teach that would still be useful? Now, in my early days, I flirted with the dark side of obfuscation, law and academia. It's much easier to obfuscate and, you know, that's what academics know, that that kind of writing is actually easier. It's easier to be thick and kind of like long-winded, you know. It's much harder to like hone down and get to the real nitty gritty and be brief. But honing and editing, chipping away, removing the excess, 
that doesn't necessarily mean terse or capital S serious. Indeed, I hope that one of the things that my work shares with Austin's is a lightness of touch and a sense of humor, of making light of things that are actually serious. But that presents its own challenges. That's something I've really grappled with as a writer, as a thinker, as a student, is this idea that uh, light comedic things aren't serious. They're very serious. Like uh, when I was younger, I felt like I had three choices when I was younger. And they all turned out to be the wrong choice that I made. <laughs> so, so let me walk you through these. Yeah, yeah. The first, the first choice was pictures versus words. Right. I thought that words were more serious, so I picked those. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, poetry versus fiction was right. another one. Um, when I was taking creative writing workshops, it seemed like fiction was more serious than poetry. Mm, yeah. So I was like, oh, I'll throw myself into fiction. And finally, the third one was tragedy versus comedy. Right. Um, do you, uh, you know, tra- the tragedy is more serious than the comedy. Right. And I made those three terrible choices in college in particular. I picked <laughs> words over pictures. Oh, right. Uh, I picked fiction over poetry and I picked tragedy over comedy and that I literally studied tragedy when I did a little stint in Cambridge. Yeah. And um, it was only when I got out of college and I threw all that stuff out that I realized that actually my natural voice and inclination was the exact opposite of what I thought was serious. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not like, and and now of course, what's interesting is that I see those as like kind of tensions that I like to navigate in my work. So like pictures and words, it's like, well, they have to be together for me. That's when the work really works. I'm like, it's it's the dance. It's like why why you have the, you have the fool and you have King Lear. Exactly. And the fool is what creates some of the light that allows the weight of King Lear to kind of land. And this, yeah. And that's like with my books, I try to keep a comedic voice, but talk about very serious things. I mean, like I, I always try to err on the side of lightness and comedy in the, in in brevity and tightness. And then, um, yeah. And as far as fiction and poetry, I mean, you know, I make poems now. So it's like, yeah. you know, duh. And I have no aptitude um, for inventing worlds or um, inventing character. I, I don't think that way. And it takes a very special brain. Yeah. And it, it takes a special mind that wants to be in another world yeah. for that long. Like for me, I don't really want to. I love being in other worlds, worlds that people have created for me. me too. Yeah. Um, but I don't really want to invent another, this world is enough for me for whatever <laughs> reason, you yeah. know, I just like chopping it up and like, yeah. you know, so, um, yeah, those were like the big, um, those are like the big choices as a young writer. And I just think it's great that I picked the wrong thing right away, <laughs> right. you know, <laughs> um, well, where, where are there, where are there trace elements of those three earlier choices in how you show up now? Oh, well, that's a great question, um, which is really just a placeholder for like, I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the pictures and words thing is all over the work. That's true. I mean, yeah, yeah. absolutely all over the work. I will say that I call myself a writer who draws. And the reason I do that is because I do think I think primarily like a writer. I think mm. I'm more of a writer than an artist or, you know, yeah. a painter or something. I think that I think in terms of uh, language is a big deal to me. And I think of pictures as a kind, like a lot of the things I do is picture writing, you know, that, and that comes from my studying of comics, which, you know, people think that comics is illustration mixed with fiction. It's actually not, it's more like graphic design and poetry. Like when you really get down to it, you're pushing shapes around on a page and yeah. you're trying to be really precise with language at the same time. So and that famous, um, that famous insight from um, what's his name, Scott? Um, how comics work? Scott McCloud. Scott McCloud, which is yeah, like you know, it's comics. it's the gaps, it's the gaps in between the the three panels. Yes, which is where where the world's happening. And I'm yeah, like, that's magical for me. That's poetry as well. Absolutely, and. Um, Art Spiegelman says that, you know, he likes to think of um, haiku, like a, right. a, 
a four comic. It's interesting. Like if you look at peanuts, I forget who made the, I think it was the cartoonist Seth who made this argument. Yeah. He said, if you look at peanuts, there's always like, it almost has the structure of a haiku. If you think about the third panel as the breath before the mm. punchline. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, um, so that's always really appealed to me. Um, but comics just is something that I just, that's a form that I just, it's kind of strange. I've never actually attempted any comics of my own because right. the, the comics I actually draw are in my diary. I, right. um, I, I draw my family as cartoons yeah, in my diary do. a lot. And I got that from studying people like um, James Kochalka, who um, is someone I started reading when I was very young. And he has these things called, um, uh, his strip is called American Elf. And it ran right. for like 15 years. And it was his sketchbook diaries. And he still does them now. He just like, they're not public. He has like a Patreon and he does them privately now. Um, but that, I think that there's something about a comics format that allows you to capture the moments of family life in like a right. really beautiful way. Cause a lot of times like moments in f- family life is like very mundane. And then there are these kind of moments <laughs> of brilliance, like just these kind right. of pops, especially with little kids. Cause a lot of your day is just like, Oh, you know, <laughs> and then they just do something like really brilliant Magical, yeah. and amazing. Yeah. And so the comic strip format is really good at that because it right. can capture just like, little moments. So um, I use comics as a tool. I feel really blessed to have studied comics so much because now it's like a really easy tool for me to capture those moments with my kids. So that's, that's in the work. Um, Fiction versus poetry. I mean, you know, the poetry is, it's weird because my first book was this book called newspaper blackout. That's right. And it's this weird, you know, collection of poetry that looks like if the CIA did haiku. Uh, it's like it a takes particularly the, aggressive it, CIA. We yeah, redacted it's, everything, it, except everything, for some of but them, like yeah. a few yeah. words. And yeah. and um and that book came out in 2010. Um, although I was working on it in 2008, it's one of those publishing stories where like yeah. the book got pushed back several years, as did my career. <laughs> you know? So it's like, um, so yeah, Newspaper Blackout is like this weird, very strange book. I'm amazed it's still in print. And like um, it, but it it's it, for people who are, are listening, it's, it's, I take articles from the New York times yeah. and I just take a Sharpie marker and I black out most of the words. And like, I leave a few words behind, you, you know, people yeah. immediately get it. It's like a really fun format um so but that was like um when i realized like i have a poet's i really am obsessed with sentences and i love pushing words around i could just spend all day i wanted to show you actually um (laughs) i got one of these uh stamps that you can that you can make your own like stamps oh that's good and i spent probably for people listening um, you know the signs you see, the big illuminated signs where people kind of slide the letters in, so it yes. kind of says, "Hey, it's you know, in front of a church or in front of a big mall or something." Going, you know, the barber is in, or you know, Jesus is visiting <laughs> right. or next week. But what Austin's showing is one of those little um, punch stamps that you often do with dates, um, which I know is something that you do as well. But 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 a similar idea, so you can create your own little messages on a on an ink stamp. Right. So I was played all day with like what messages would fit on this little stamp. <laughs> right. What do I want to say? I, I got this because I um I wanted to just make some stationery. I wanted to be able to stamp my my address really easily. Right. But then I got to thinking, oh, it'd be fun to like have little messages right. to like that you could stamp on pieces of mail. And then I was like, well, what would my messages be? You know, so I was like <laughs> playing around and it's like you, you, it comes with the set comes with these like little tiny rubber letters and like mm. little tweezers. And I was like moving and like, I ran out of letters for certain right. words. So I had to like, okay, well, what other words can I use? And I, and it was, I, I caught myself at this moment of geekery <laughs> just being like, this is you activate. This is literally what you could spend the rest of your life doing. Just right. like these little, like what, what little phrases, I, there's something about my brain that just like loves this, like, yeah. let's see this, the constraint of that. And it, so that was just that's like a very concrete example of just how like my I just love playing with words I see that. Yeah. and I love like just like I've gotten very into um, I've really I've gotten really into like um, I, I one of the great uh, disappointments of my life is that I haven't learned a, a language like mm. other than English. 
And, but I'm very into etymology. I always look up the etymology of right. words now, and I like think about spelling, like why words are. So you know that language is just something that's like a real passion of mine. Yeah. That's why, you know, I say books with pictures, art with words. That's like yeah. one of yeah. my taglines. That's something I put on a stamp, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so, um, and and yeah, so so like uh, so that's there. And then the tragedy versus comedy. Yeah, where's, um, the, where's the trace element of tragedy? Because your yeah. books are light and they have humor, but they have weight and they have yeah. resonance as well. Well, I mean, one of the things I realized from studying comedians is that like a lot of comedians are deeply depressive people. Mm -hmm. They're like, they're, they're borderline. I mean, almost all of, I mean, so many of them have substance right. abuse issues, trauma, um, uh, you know, same, same with podcast hosts, <laughs> yeah, yeah, same with all of us. Actually, no. Um, but you know, it's like, uh, comedy comes out of sadness is right. what is so amazing to me. Comedy does not come out of, uh, a life that is easy and no. fun. Comedy comes out of struggle and it comes out of sadness and it comes mm out of the situations we find are in, it's a survival mechanism. Right, right. And I actually read this book that I'm trying to figure out how to work into my next book, um, or I think it will influence it somehow, which is called The Comedy of Survival. It's by this right. guy named Joseph Meeker. And what he attempts to do is very strange. He tries to merge his feelings about ecology mm. um, with his ideas about comedy. And if I could summarize it very quickly for you it's that tragedy is a form in which an individual right tries to struggle against something and they have some sort of weakness that is their undoing yeah fatal there's, flaw. yeah there's a fatal flaw and they die at the end there's blood right. at the end of tragedy mm -hmm. comedy is mostly about people that are kind of connected or they're like in a group or they're the lower form of a group or, or whatever. And they bumble around. And at the end, they just kind of like half of them get married. Yeah. It's a and classic at the end, Shakespeare act. Everybody yeah. gets married. You and at the end, a, everyone gets married. Yeah, yeah. So instead of blood in tragedy, there's drink at the <laughs> right, end. Right. Right. Well, what Meeker says is that comedy is really, and this just blows my mind. I love it. Is that Meeker says that comedy for, for, a thousand years, tragedy was the model for Western civilization. That mm. was what we upheld. That is what we held serious, right? right. His point is that we need to look to comedy for survival because the only way right. we will actually survive is to do that kind of bumbling, that connectedness, that like togetherness, oh, that, so that nice. finding our web, finding our seniors, finding yeah. our like – our, our network of people, right. our ecology, right? Finding, finding a way right. to, to, to exist together. And that has been profoundly, profoundly influential on me and in all of my work since I read it. I was already kind of on that track, yeah. especially with my book, Show Your Work, because I was writing about this idea of seniors that Brian Eno talks about, which is seniors is kind of the collective form of genius. It's when yeah. a bunch of minds connected to other minds come up yeah. with really great work. Um, so I was kind of like already on that track anyway, but the Meeker book just like blew my mind because it was really an example of how mm. like, okay, one of these things I've struggled with, uh, you know, my whole adult life, like here is, here's why the work that you're doing it was both validation, but it was also another model for me. So, for right. example, um, I in the family, um, like with my family, one of my mantras is pretend it's a comedy. You know, <laughs> pretend you're pretend it's a sitcom. You know, right. <laughs> because, like like you know, don't be don't think too much of like because the tragic model is yeah. is very similar to like the um, Alison Gopnik has this book called the uh, the uh, the gardener and the carpenter, I think, which is a parenting book. And her whole thing is that a, a carpenter like uh, will take a piece of wood and like shape it into something. Right. And a gardener kind of grows things. I think it's very unfair to carpenters. Right. Because uh, I don't necessarily love the metaphor because I think good carpenters find a great piece of wood and then the wood tells yeah, them what it wants exactly. to be. Exactly. Um, so I think it's more like the factory in the garden. Right. right? A factory yeah. like stamps out. But if you think about that tragic model of like yeah. – 
you know, raging against things other than letting things grow. Yeah. So I see this deep connection between gardening and comedy in a sense. And that's what I try to do in the house is I try to approach parenting and my artwork now. You can tell why I'm working out. Right? <laughs> uh, I try to approach it more like a gardener, a light comedic spirit like yeah like i think it's funny that like in being there the the main character's name is is gardener right know, that's Chauncey right Chauncey Gardner. Famous movie, this idea yeah. that you would just kind of move through let things grow and so yeah like this idea of comedy gardening these have been profoundly yeah um these have shaped my work profoundly in the past couple of years but but that's how those three things have yeah. kind of like come together um and i don't want to like um I don't want to unnaturally segue, but the writer I'm going to read, the 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 writer who draws that I'm going to read <laughs> later today, those things are very profoundly right. present in her work. Building on something, I, I'm I'm keen to get to the two pages, but I want to ask you a question before we go there, which is, um, you know, if comedy is bumbling together, and which I love, <laughs> it's a fantastic definition. And it's really obvious just in our conversation so far, what a rich intellectual community you have. Like you've referenced about 97 books and <laughs> artists and writers and thinkers so far. Right. I'm, I'm wondering how you garden your community, how you find it, how you oh, nurture it, that's... how you give it love, how you discover it. Well, one of the things I really struggle with with our profession, um, this whatever it is that we do. I mean, <laughs> yeah, whatever that. Well, is. what I do, whatever it is, uh, I struggle with loneliness a lot, mm. um, and I think a lot of people struggle with loneliness in this culture. One of the things that occurred to me at a very young age, um, I grew up in the middle of a cornfield in Ohio, literally. And I just knew that there was a world out there that cared about the same things that I did. I just had to figure out how to get there. Right. Um, so I assumed in my young life, it would be just getting the hell out of town um, and getting somewhere, going to New York City, going to Chicago, like whatever. Right. As I got older, I realized this thing called the web came around. <laughs> and, um, you know, the web yeah. dial up came into my life about high school. You right. know, uh, maybe late high school, actually, or mid middle high school and um, dial up at our house uh, came with a little bit of web space. And I just immediately realized, oh, my God, you can be whoever you want on this thing. And yeah. you just give people your address and anything you want to be, you can just present yourself that way on this thing and you can be someone else. You know, that just like occurred to me like very early on. Right. And it also, I'm somebody who always liked to do a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, you know, when I heard the term Renaissance man, I was just like, <laughs> when I was a kid, Chez I was moi. just like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, there's exactly. a word for this. Yeah, I want to exactly. make pictures. I want to make music. I want to write books. Like, oh my God. Like when I See, saw the me, back I was of like, I want, I want to wear silk stockings and a lace ruff. <laughs> right. That's yes, what I was hoping it would mean, but Play also doing other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I like, like one of the foundational texts, I would say for me is not one of Shel Silverstein's books, mm. but the back of a Shel Silverstein book. I right. think it's where the sidewalk ends. Oh yeah. Where classic. he's sitting there with his crazy bald head. And I love Shel Silverstein. You can't tell what race he is. Like right. I when I was a kid, I was like, I don't know what this this guy's <laughs> like an alien or something. <laughs> and it said like it said like Shel Silverstein uh writes books plays guitar and sings and writes songs and has a good time or something like that. It's something <laughs> right. very, and I was like, that's it. Oh. I didn't even care about <laughs> Shel Silverstein that much. I just was like, yeah. this dude does, he draws, he writes, he plays music. Like yeah. I want to be this figured guy, it out. you know, yeah. this guy's figured something out. Right. And then I found out how truly interesting he was later on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, you know, that to me was like, Oh, so, so the web was this way of, I was like, Oh, I can take all these things I'm interested in. Yeah. And like, create some sort of webs you know like web. so i i really wish i could dig up some of the, i probably could through like um the problem was i always used images on my site and uh wayback machines not very good at getting the right images. that's right 
Um, but, the, but that was the other thing, pictures and words, right? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh, great. You can, and I immediately realized with the web, Hey, if you draw your own pictures and put them online, that immediately makes your website different than any other website. Right. So that like occurred to me right away. So, but to answer your question that I'm getting leading up to, it occurred to me that I can meet the people I wanted to meet through this medium. Like, yeah. and I don't know for sure whether that was like. That wasn't quite ready for me in high school, but it occurred to me right after college. College yeah. was about like, I met my crew. I met my good buddies. We were a bunch of like, we, you know, we saw ourselves as hard drinking intellectuals. Hard drawing, hard drinking. Hard drinking, <laughs> mostly intellectuals. <laughs> and like, you know, that was like, so, but then when I got out of college, I immediately realized that a blog was the way. That mm. was that was how I was going to do what I wanted to yeah. do. Immediately, I realized that, and and so my community weirdly has always been like I mean the people that I hold closely in my life, people who come into the studio like like when you were here not long yeah. ago, these are people that came to my life through this digital medium. Yeah, you yeah. know I'm sure I bump into people around town, but primarily. Um, you know, it's been my work on this yeah. weird machine up in the cloud. You know, the yeah. web has really been the thing that has brought people into my orbit. It's interesting. It's like your lighthouse. You're like, yeah. this, is, this is my light yeah. and this is what I stand for. I've always, and yeah. Some people choose to navigate by that. Yeah, I've always thought of it as like a satellite or something. Like, right. you know, it's my own little planet that people can like pop in and then they can, yeah. or a satellite and then they can come visit me on my planet or something. I don't know. <laughs> I've always liked that kind of like yeah, yeah. universe thing. But like, that's the, so now it's very difficult. Uh, like, I would say I'm always someone who, you have to understand, in in spirit, I'm very much in favor of the collective and yeah. but i'm also deeply misanthropic this is something yeah. people probably don't know about me um because my books are so like kind of upbeat and stuff yeah. Yeah. The, it, like m the voice in my books is like the nicest kindest version of me kind of like a comedian in real mm. life i'm i'm deeply pessimistic i'm very misanthropic like i i I'm married to like the queen of introverts, which has made me more introverted. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I have kids, which means like I'm home a lot. So like mm. I struggle a lot with community. So I would say like my real communities are like people I interface with on yeah. online. Uh, my newsletter community is incredible. Yeah. I talk to those folks every week. Um, and, that's been and way... for everybody who's listening who hasn't yet signed up for Austin's newsletter. I've subscribed since way back when. Uh, you should get the paid subscription to his Substack because you get some bonuses there, which are uh, wonderful. So just a plug for Thank your newsletter you. being absolutely terrific. Um, yeah, and when I started my Substack, I kind of was like, eh, you know, community, that's like, an, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. But that's turned out to be the biggest selling point for me, yeah. not just for other people. I'm like, these are like just the nicest, kindest. And it's funny because... I should have known that because yeah. the signing line at one of my book events is the sweetest group of people. It's so good, isn't it? Yeah. They're so nice. And they've made friendship. Like people make friends in line. They're just the nicest people. Yeah. And at one point in the tour, like on the keep going tour, we had a baby that started crying. And I said, by the way, if anyone has kid i want the kids here bring your kids like i i made a point yeah. at a certain point like bring your kids i don't care like mine are home you, you know like it's it's just very so people have started showing like i remember i mean this makes me a little wistful because i haven't been on book tour in so long but like um people would show up in multiple generations like yeah. i i've seen like you know moms and daughters show up uh, oh. like grown yeah. women who are like Oh, she sends me, your, and then we talk about our favorite things. Oh. You know, just these really sweet yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. So, so there's that. But I will say that my real crew these days, I'm a guy who likes to have a gang. Yeah, like I was the, and I was the. Um, it's funny that there's a movie called Napoleon out because my nickname was Napoleon in college really? because I was the leader of, of our yeah. little, but yeah. I'm short. So it's like, they called me, <laughs> you know, Napoleon. I like having a gang. I, I like being right. part of a gang. So to me, that's, um, 
that's my family. Like, yeah. I feel like my family is like a little gang, you know, yeah. we're, we're like a, we're like the prototypical, like nuclear family. It's like two kids, two parents, like, you yeah, know, yeah. it's like the fab four beetle, whatever, you know, like you remind before me of my, my wife a little bit who would also say that she's delightful and she's also misanthropic. <laughs> and and her, 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 her term, which I love is she's like, I have a very small a list and I don't have a B list. <laughs> I can't wait to meet your wife one so day. So it's life. like you make it onto Marcella's A list, and you're like, yes. you are, you have, oh. and, and she is so good. She's like, when, if you have her as a friend, you are lucky because oh. she's one of the great yeah. friends of all time. But she just, she's like, I'm, I'm really clear. I don't like that we, many people, <laughs> but the people I like, I really like. <laughs> we talked about this. My wife's the same way. It's like, oh my god, if she, if you if if you if she's your friend, I mean, yeah. she is the best friend. <laughs> but my god, don't cross her. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't know if also, that's the that, no, Irish that's Italian yeah, yeah, or yeah. what. But but um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's true. But it's also, I mean, like the great um you know, being in love with an introvert and being, you know, we've been together for 20 years now. And one of the great joys of my life is watching people warm up to right. her because I'm always telling people, I'm like, I'm not the person you should be interested in, <laughs> right, in exactly. the family. No, no. Like I'm, I'm telling you. And I, and, it, and it's funny because, um, when I meet people, uh, when I meet, I mean, not famous, but just whoever I meet, yeah. I always want to talk to their spouses because right. I always assume that the spouse is probably more interesting <laughs> than, the, in my case. than the, than the sociopath true. that right. wants to be famous, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, like, you oh my God, I feel like, very seen. Austin, whoever, I feel very seen. <laughs> you know, whoever wants to be famous, who has some sort of wound that they're trying to make up for. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm like, you want to talk to the person that can actually put up with them that's like behind the scenes. <laughs> You know, so that's like my always my joke. Um, yeah. But you know, it's like uh, that's like my friend uh, Ryan Holiday who lives over yeah, yeah. in Bastrop. Um, you know, his wife Sam is the real. As she says, she says one of us is a stoic and the other one writes about stoicism. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like dead on like like i mean i think that's that's like true yeah. in our family it's like one of us is truly creative and interesting and the other one writes about creativity <laughs> and being interesting so you know but that's like so <laughs> this is like but yeah as far as community i have to say if um a midlife crisis of mine that's been the best midlife crisis i turned 40 this year is i have a bike gang so yeah. i have a group of dudes who we uh, our re our sensei master splinter in our group had an accident so he hasn't been riding lately so the group's kind of like we're 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 trying to piece together things but that has been the great uh one of the great blessings of the past year and a half for me is i started yeah. riding a bike and i have a little bike gang and by and, bike gang, you're not talking huge Harley Davidsons. You're talking about bikes no, with gears. No, dorks and, on bicycles. Yeah, exactly. Dorks yes. Helmeted. Like yeah. uh, not, I don't personally, I try to avoid the spandex. The mammal, I'm very middle-aged um, man in like. I'm like, I'm very, um, I, I like, I have like a kind of a punk approach to bike riding. I don't like a lot of fancy gear. Yeah. Um, but I do like. Yeah. I mean, I look like a biker when I'm on my own. So let, <laughs> let's not, let's be clear. Like, you know, but no, that's been the great. And I think that like, I'm always like the older I get, I'm in search of those kind of convivial activities, yeah. what Aunt Illich would call like convivial technologies in which like, oh, you know, you phrase. feel more like, yeah, mm -hmm. like the bicycle really puts you in the world in a way that's like fundamentally human. Yeah. Um, I love everything about being on a bicycle. I love the it's it's in between walking and driving. Yeah. It's the same perspective of walking. It's just you can cover large grounds. You can stop easily. It's very dangerous. I mean, that's right. something that should be put out there. But when you show up on a bike somewhere and there are other people that showed up on a bike, you like instantly have a connection. I just I love everything about riding a bicycle. I don't that's and, so good. And, and it's funny because when I was a kid, I loved bicycles, but I didn't have anywhere to ride because right. I like lived on a country road and like I would have got squashed. Um, so like, uh, yeah, so that's been so that's like a real community. I think one thing and this might sound kind of weird because it's not like I'm a famous person, but um, once you start like 
once you're out in the world, like yeah. it's very like you want to meet people. It's fun to meet fans for sure. Yeah. But it's also really fun to be anonymous and totally to meet people yeah. on their own, like yeah. to meet people in your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, like a couple of my friends don't care at all what I do. And I love <laughs> right. that. You yeah. know, like I don't, I don't want, you know, I like being just having those relationships, those normal relationships yeah. in the world. Like I cherish that stuff because so much of my other life is like, you know, yes, I feel very much like a member of the community, but I'm obviously the ringleader, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's like, I'm, I mean, it's gathered yeah, you, around me. Yeah. You, you have know? a way of, um, when you play that role, you can, it just warps time and space a little bit because you have a heavy, yes. heavy gravity compared to other people. I like people. that. Yeah. Um, there's a mass. In other, in other you're... communities, you just have, uh, you have the same mass as everybody yes. else. You're sort yeah. of a, yeah, you can be more of a node in a network. Whereas yeah, like exactly. in that community, I'm kind of a central node yeah. around which everyone kind of gathers. So it's just a different like structure. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I'll be honest, like, and and this is what's interesting about what I'm going to read later is I consider Linda Berry, whose book I'm going to read later, um, she's one of my great teachers. Mm. And yet we only met for about two hours one time. <laughs> and um, one of the things I wrote about in Steal Like an Artist was I said, you know, the great thing about dead masters is they can't refuse you as a student. <laughs> and I have recently realized it's true of people who are around too. In fact, it's true of everyone. You can make right. everyone your your teacher. Right. And that's something I've, that's an evolution in my own thinking is that anyone can be a teacher. And so Linda for, you know, I don't know how she would feel about it, but she is, to me, I, I consider her my great teacher. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'm always joking like, yeah, she probably wishes she'd been mean to me. Um, but, um, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> let's go, let's go to, let's go to the, your, your two pages. Um, yeah. you're talking about Linda Barry, who is one of the great cartoonists. I have a bunch, I think I have what it is on my shelf just around the corner here, but how did you first meet her and her work? Well, let me set the stage. So in 2006, um, my wife is from Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. um, and that's where we moved after college. Uh, we decided to move to Cleveland for a couple of years, have jobs. This was in the aughts, early aughts, where like you can get an apart a nice apartment in Cleveland for like, yeah. I don't know, 800 bucks, 700, like in the middle of everything, you know, just a nice uh, it was that kind of dream of, yeah. you know, rent was fairly cheap and you could have a nice place in the middle of everything. And Cleveland was at your fingertips. <laughs> um, and I lived, my thing in Cleveland was I went to every single author reading event I could. And there was this great bookstore around the corner from my apartment called Max Bax. Oh, cool. That's still there. It's in Coventry in Cleveland, um, up the hill from Little Italy, and down the hill is Little Italy and like the museum district in Cleveland. Um, and I would just go to like anybody who was at Max Bax, I would go down to the basement. And one of the writers who read one night was this guy named Dan Sean. And I drew him, and Kelly Link was there, which was amazing. And um, and I drew them. And I blogged about them. <laughs> and this is when not that many people, I mean, this is pre social media. It's 2006. Right. And like people had Google alerts on their names. And, uh, and Dan sent me a very nice email. And he said, You made me look like a Linda Berry character. <laughs> and I said, Who's Linda Berry? And he kind of like, you know, I, yeah. Uh, he said, well, why don't we, I think we met up for coffee. Cause at the time he was, he was very kind to me. I I'm surprised how kind he was to me, but, um, he was doing a graphic novel class at Oberlin mm -hmm. and I was in charge of the graphic novel section at, at the, um, uh, the library, the library that yeah. I worked at, uh, the Cleveland, um, Cuyahoga County system. Um, and I worked in a, a, a regional branch. And I think he wanted to pick my brain about like how you should teach the graphic novel class. Cause this is like, I mean, this is 20 years, this is almost 20 years ago when graphic novels just were still like, yeah, 
yeah. a weird a yeah weird they weren't the some, industry some, some sect, yeah. yeah like yeah. now my kids anyway that's neither here or there but like the if you're like a 13 year old that likes to read graphic novels like holy crap like yeah. life was a lot different than it was you know in the 90s <laughs> yeah. um but um you tell like, that to young people today right? they don't care <laughs> these young people i don't know how good anyway um so dan took me out and we had coffee and he said look you need to meet Linda Barrett. Like you need to come. She's come to Oberlin. You need to come out and see her read. I said, okay, cool. Like, <laughs> all right. So we drove out to Oberlin. Oberlin's like 40 minutes from Cleveland. Right. Um, you know, like Lena Dunham went to Oberlin to give you an idea of like who yeah. goes to Oberlin. It's a good school. It's, it's very expensive. <laughs> um, but Dan ran, ran the creative writing program there. And, uh, and I, it's in a chemistry lab, and Linda comes in, and anyone who's met Linda, she jokes about this too. She has this magical hippie vibe, <laughs> magical hippie vibe. She comes in, she's got these cowboy boots on. She takes her cowboy boots off, <laughs> and she stands up. And by now, people kind of know, like. You know, at the time, Linda was like an alternative cartoon. Like people yeah. have been reading Ernie Pook's comique in, in like the alternative papers for like 30 years. But she wasn't the like teacher that she is now. She was like doing workshops and stuff. But like she was more yeah. like she wasn't known as a teacher as much right. at the time. And she took her shoes off and she sang. She said, when I get nervous, I sing. So I'm going to sing. And she like sang <laughs> this song. <laughs> and you, just, you know you just like immediately fall in love with this of woman course. you know it's yeah. just like this magical experience <laughs> so then she reads from her novel cruddy which right. is just like it's um to try to explain it to people it's like uh it's a it's like a murderous it's this girl who goes on this like murderous road trip with her father it's one of the darkest it's <laughs> it extremely <won't> <laughs> dark yeah. it, it's you know and it's illustrated and it's just like yeah. And it starts once upon a time in a cruddy place in a cruddy street, you know, and she just starts reading. And um, if you go on my website and type Linda Berry Oberlin, you can see a drawing I actually did of this. Oh, fantastic. Time. Yeah. Um, I remember the sim like, I think the, I knew, I think the pervert nerd, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the little, like, that's how I was taught the little, like, you know, math diagrams were on the, the right. chalkboard behind her and she's reading from this book. So anyway, I'm just stunned. I mean, you know, this is a person that for the first time I really felt like, well, here's a person who puts pictures and words together in a way right. that I just get, I get this woman. I, I, and I want what she's got. Yeah. You, know, you get that greedy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you get greed. You know, when you're in the presence of someone like that, you want what they have oh. really bad, you know, it just then chills down my spine. Cause I've had yeah. one or two moments, different contexts, different people where yeah. I've just gone, Oh, that's you, it. You've just right? shown me a doorway to a secret room that yeah. like, that's the room I've been looking for. Yes. I just didn't even, I, I didn't even really know I was looking for it, but I've just, yeah. I've seen it now and, let and me, it changes everything. And let me stop and say, I am in no way um, unique. You yeah. can talk to several people who they've gone to a Linda Berry workshop or whatever, and she's had this effect on them. It's yeah. just, she's magnetic. She's a genius. Um, yeah. She is. Um, and I'm actually one of those people who said she should get a MacArthur grant <laughs> for years and years and years. And then she got one and I was like, all right. Um <laughs> So we go to the bar after uh, Dan says, do you want to come to the bar with us? I was like, are you? Yes. <laughs> yes. You need to touch the hem of this. So, room. you know, yeah. I sat at the bar with like Dan and there was another um, student, a couple of students there. And one of the students I think knew of my blog and that might've been why I was, but I just was like, just listen to her. Mm. And my wife and I were getting married, and I remember her saying, "Oh, you're getting married. I love being married." And you know, she talked about Kevin, her husband, a little bit. And she was just so, you know, just so incredibly supportive. And I swear to you, I mean, I've run my career off of the fumes of that. Just <sighs> that encounter. Just that. That was one of those, just absolute, just like change life. One of yeah. those life changing things. I'll say that. that and uh and then like my wife and I went to Manhattan on our honeymoon and I saw a Saul Steinberg show. Mm. 
and I was reading a lot of Vonnegut at the time. Right. And those that th- those three, Saul Steinberg and Linda Berry and Kurt Vonnegut, and the way they think about pictures and words and their like whole deal, yeah, just like formed for me like that. <laughs> vo- yeah. uh, that's what I wanted, you know. It's whether like, my work uh, reflects it's that like or... plutonium in an engine, yeah, it's, it's like, like this will run just forever. The crucible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. like a a catalyst. They were catalysts, yeah. you know. And, um, I'll just, you know, just changed my life and that is so, so to come to what it is yeah. now, um, what it is, I think came out in 2008. Yeah. So Linda would have been working on this book. Um, yeah. First edition, May, 2008. So I met her in 2006, kind of towards the end of 2006. So I immediately found everything I could get my hands on of hers. Right. And um, this is a book that I I was like a music fan. Like, you remember when you were like, this was more true in the inter- in the pre-internet age where you would follow a band and you would read every single, ma- like every single magazine article you could yeah. find. You'd, you'd pick up like an EP exactly. that they might release or something. You'd be yeah. like waiting for this new album. So this was really <laughs> interesting. And I, I couldn't, I didn't have time to grab them to show them to you, but Tin House, the, the literary magazine had a graphic issue right. where they published the first pages from this. And right. I like have that in my archive. <laughs> um, th- Drawn in Quarterly, which is just one of my yeah, favorite, yeah. who it's publishes great. this. Um, yeah who, you know, they deserve a lot of credit, by the way, uh, as a publisher who is willing to publish Linda's books in, in the way that they are. Right. And, uh, they have been, they are a wonderful publisher and they, they deserve a lot. The editorial there deserves a lot of, uh, uh, a big, yeah, for, for, for the way they've gone. And then for free comic book day, there's a little activity book that was in the back of this that they published. So I have that too. So it was like, just this yeah, thing that led up. Yeah. yeah. And when I got what it is, um, it just was like anybody who's opened this book, I can describe it to you. A lot of it's done on um yeah. a lot of it's done on legal paper. That's okay. Like, that's one of his signature moves, yeah, right? One of her legal si- pads. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of it is drawn with a brush. Um Japanese sumi ink, like that dark, right. like an ink stick and a yeah. Um, that real dark ink, uh, by hand and a lot of it's colored in like watercolor. I mean, it's, it's like a William Blake manuscript, really. That's a perfect I mean, way of describing really, that. That is totally Blake. I mean, you're very Blake, for people yeah. listening, you're, you're flicking through the pages and showing us and it's got yeah. that dark energy of a Blake picture. It does. And she's tapped in, in a way that, I mean, I think Linda would tell you that there's an image world and right. she's able to tap into it. Um, so, you know, this book just, uh, and I love, I ripped this off, uh, in, right. in Steal Like an Artist. She has all of her index cards on the end paper. That's she has right. all her index cards from her workshops. That's pretty so I, that's when you look in the back of Steal Like an Artist and you see all the index cards, that's where that's stolen from. Yeah. I love your, um, I've seen it on your blog as well, where you kind of show the making, you know, you're showing your work in terms of building your books and you're showing all the cards you have and how you work through those. So another book of Linda's that I should have had nearby, it's on my, I have a Linda Berry shelf in the living room. It's like a, (laughs) you know, uh, but um, there's another book of hers called 100 Demons, which is a series of comic strips she drew for Salon, I think, using the Sumi brush. And, um, she, uh, so that, that book has a, you can do this too yeah. part in it, in the back. Like, here's the brush you get. Here's the grindstone. Here's the ink. Here's what kind of paper you should use. Here's how to do it. Here's how to paint your own demons. That was hugely influential on me. Cause I thought, oh my God, this person's brain, she's doing these brilliant cartoons, but then she's saying to the reader, you can do this too. Right. Right. I was always, I was super inspired by that early in my career. Um, that's in newspaper blackout. Cause the end of newspaper blackout is like, here's how you make a newspaper blackout poem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the heart of, that's also another thing I stole from her is this idea that if my work is good, it should make you want to make things. Right. Um, so yeah, so that, that's sort of the run up to what it that's is. A great run- and how did you come to pick the two pages? Cause clearly 
you could have picked any two of I don't know, hundreds of pages, but you've narrowed yeah. down to just two. What so, have you chosen for us? I'm going to read um, two pages. <laughs> You'd think I would have actually put the bookmark in here. Oh, here it is. Actually, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to read a, a section of the book that could almost be a standalone essay. It's called mm. Two Questions. Perfect. Um, and it's actually even in a different style than a lot of the book. It's I think it's probably done with like uniball pen. Yep. And it's more like black and white. It has a lot of cross hatching, a lot of um, a lot of uh, like it's got um, watercolor, but it's only like two colors. It's it's actually pretty restrained compared to the rest of the book. Right. Um, there's a little less collage. It's a lot more drawing. Um, and it's this beautiful story of how Linda kind of tapped into this way of drawing that we know as children and yeah. we lose. Right. And so that's what two questions is about. Perfect. Austin, the stage is yours. Well, I want to, I'm going to describe a little bit of what the page looks like. I'm going to read two pages. This page has a cartoon of Linda and she's at a desk and there's a giant cephalopod <laughs> next to her and but she's struggling course. yeah she's struggling with her um she's struggling with her her art and in big letters at the top is two questions is this good does this suck i'm not sure when these two questions became the only two questions i had about my work or when making pictures and stories turned into something I called my work. I just know I'd stopped enjoying it and instead began to dread it. Before the two questions, pictures and stories happened in a way that didn't involve much thinking. One line led to another until they somehow finished. I never felt like I was trying and the drawing itself didn't matter too much to me afterward. But the two questions find everybody. <laughs> and and uh, Linda is drawing herself as a, as a young girl drawing yeah. on here. And there are ghosts. And they're saying, show me, show me. Where is she? Let's see that picture story. And there's cats and all kinds of animals. When Linda loves drawing animals. She says when she's nervous or frightened or worn out she loves drawing pictures of animals and right. um and so yeah that's the those are now it's a graphic you know it's a yeah. it's a graphic piece so there aren't many words but to me um the two questions is this good does this suck um everybody that's what you know there's a point at which drawing is this kind of automatic thing and i've one of the real gifts that linda's given me um too is that she does this thing at wisconsin She's like a chaired professor at Wisconsin now and like their interdisciplinary art program. I, I might be making that up. Um, but, <laughs> uh, she's got a promotion. She doesn't yeah, even realize um, yet. So uh, she does this thing where she puts PhD students together with four-year-olds. Nice. And the PhD student describes the problem to the four-year-old and then they draw together. And she says that it always just blows these <laughs> PhD students' minds because they're so uptight and they're so in their work and they're yeah. so in that world of big words like we talked about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um and the four year olds just blow their mind. And and I've had a couple of four year olds now and they will get you unstuck in a way spending a little bit of time with a four year old mm. will get creative people unstuck in this beautiful way. Um, because they just are tapped into that same image world um, that we all tap into at an early age where everything's right. kind of psychedelic. Nothing really has names yet. And there's no fear. There's absolutely no self-consciousness. Your right. frontal lobes haven't really developed yet. So you're not yeah. really like conscious of being, you're not self-conscious. You're not like worried about that much. You know, you're, you do things with a kind of authority and, <laughs> Yeah. You know, so when I used to watch my sons draw when they were four, I mean, it was like watching Picasso. It, <laughs> it really was like watching one yeah. of those Picasso. If you watch Picasso draw, he just has it's this light. elegant, yeah, really this, kind of yeah just these yeah. elegant, you know, just sureness. You know, yeah. my son would would literally sit there and he'd scribble out a drawing and he'd look at it 
and he'd literally toss it over his shoulder. Like, so, just like, kind of like, I'm just, done. No pressure. Oh, myself. I'm well, like, that's I'm over. Whatever the next thing is. Yeah. yeah. He would do this yeah. drawing and he'd look at, and, and I was primed to recognize this because this is the kind of stuff that Linda talked about. Yeah. There are no questions. There's no two questions. Yeah. There's just the experience of making the thing. Ah, oh, and then the next experience. Austin, so, how do you, <laughs> how do you navigate that when you have, you know, tens of thousands of people who wait for your next thing on a weekly basis. Right. Well, you have to, um, you have to find that place for, for yourself in which you just cultivate this spirit in which you're just having an experience with the page. Right. And that's what Linda says. You come to the page to have an experience. You don't come to the page to get a finished drawing. Right. And it's amazing how many of my friends still they can't do this. Like I was talking to my friend, Wendy McNaughton and she's, you know, she's a brilliant artist. She's like, well, she works with, you know, she works with kids drawing and she still says that when she sits down and draws, she's always thinking in the back of her head, yeah, I'm going to sell this or I'm going to put this on my whatever, (laughs) you know, it's still there. But for me, it's like, I just have to zone out enough. I just have to get into the work enough that, that it's just, you know, just like kind of, I'm not thinking about sharing the thing while I'm making it. Yeah. Um, what you're really trying to do is you, you, you get that. Those two questions are the editor voice. Right. And what you have to do is you have to silence that. So much of creative books are about this. You just have to silence that editor voice long enough to be bad and to be totally in the moment and to just let whatever comes come. Mm. Um, I have been helped recently by, I've read some really good books on improv and music. Right. Um, one book I read is called Effortless Mastery by this guy named Kenny Warner. <laughs> and he has this way of talking about practicing the piano. I'm a, I'm a pianist um, too. So like I, that's, that's the instrument I'm actually trained on. Um, and we could go into long winded discussions of how the piano keys and the typewriter are very similar and, blah 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 but the thing is is that kenny has a way of talking about practicing where you're silencing that critic too even when you're practicing you're just trying to be there with the notes and you're just trying to let the notes come that want to come and then when there's a wrong note you either try to accept it or if you get thrown out you stop and you pick your hands up so he has this beautiful way of being present it's all about being present it's very zen you know it's Mm -hmm. very like it's it's very much like what we're all trying to what we all can't do anymore, which is like just be in an experience. But there's something about the brush, and this is what Matt, what Linda taught me. There's something about drawing with a brush that it's just this kind of magical thing. So that's what I do with my diary with. Um, yeah, and I literally use a Pentel pocket brush pen to do my diary, and there's just something about that flow of ink and just inkiness i think there's i think it's really interesting that linda loves to draw cephalopods right. and octopuses because like or they ink, ink producing it's inky. creatures yeah, yeah yeah and they're the most if you read about the octopus it's the thing on the evolutionary chain that's the furthest from us oh so they're the weirdest so interesting there's a lot of, i don't know if linda i know i know she's aware of all this but yeah. The cephalopod, and I have a original drawing of a cephalopod that Linda did that I have in my house. Um, they have brains in their tentacles. That's right. <laughs> so their nervous right. system extends. Their tentacles actually do it like yeah. thinking. Like they don't have like a they. Their nervous system isn't the same as ours. Where um, there's like. In our nervous system, it's like the brain and the spine is the primary, yeah. and then the secondary is all the limbs and stuff. Have you read the um, Ed Yong book on animal senses? I'm reading it right now. Oh, my God. I've been a- reading it all year. It's taken me all freaking year <laughs> to read that book because it's like it's so brilliant, but it's, it's so it, dense. It's, and it's exactly. Just like chewing on all this stuff. There's a video of him talking about the book that I right. actually think is like, I want this on Netflix, like please Netflix. <laughs> right. like, do it. But yeah. So thinking about the sensory, that was the major other lesson that Linda taught me is mm. she, she has a phrase. She says, 
in the digital age, don't forget to use your digits. She really right. believes in the power of the hand. And that's right in Steal Like an Artist, use your hands. And this this idea that the hands tell us when we're working as artists or musicians or whatever, the body tells the brain as much as the brain mm-hmm. tells the body. Mm-hmm. And if you're just making your art like this, yeah, like it's not going to work. Like you need to bring your whole as much as you can bring your whole body into the experience. That's why like with so many writers, um, they need like, that's why the question, do you use a pencil and paper or you use a typewriter or whatever? It's actually a very important question. It seems very, um, it seems very like eh, some amateur hour Q and (laughs) a session, but it's like really interesting and important. It doesn't matter. Like it doesn't mean what quality it just means like the quality of the work. Accessing. Accessing so, yeah. a greater range of capacity to create through yeah. the ritual of the materials that you use. Right. So I think like, you know, for me, it is um, it is a lot about the getting into that spirit of where the editor is like mm. over here. A lot of that is about the proper uh, time, space and materials. You set up a, a situation in which you have ample, you have a set amount of time and you come to a space that's kind of comforting or, or private in which you can make mistakes. Yeah. And then you use materials that just sing to you. Yeah. That's kind of the magic formula, time, space, and materials. And then when you're working, <laughs> there's another triad, which is the head, heart, and the hands, yeah. particularly with drawing. Um, there needs to be a dance between what you see and what you can see in your head and whatever, and what's happening on the page and the spirit in which you're doing the work and very rarely, but on occasion, all those things are activated together (laughs) and that's when the really good work is. But do you, do you you pursue mastery? Do you pursue success or do you just be present and try and, summon those two triads because if you find a way of yeah. having those two, those two triads you know something magical is going to come through i'm anti mastery because in my experience the minute you think you know what you're doing the work <laughs> has died right so i'm kind of like uh i'm just interested in a fresh one of you know einstein supposedly said i think it was einstein i don't know what who cares who said it but like the insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results yeah it's also called writing (laughs) it's also (laughs) called uh you know playing music it's it's that it's actually that's actually the deal is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results it's coming to that blank page every time and just having the guts to sit. I think about the guts a lot, actually, because we actually have a lot of neurons in our guts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our guts talk. There's a, there's a thing called the brain gut axis. That's right. That I'm really into. Um, but like having the guts to sit and be uncertain. That's why with comedy, something we didn't talk about is the fool, the kind right. of holy fool figure. The right. fool in like a tarot deck is the symbol of zero. It's a fresh start. It's a new mm-hmm. beginning, blank slate. The fool is not, does not have preconceived notions. Right. Like it's the beginner's mind that Suzuki talks about. Um, it's what kids have, that yeah. be- beginner's yeah. mind. Um, you're trying to get that when you're at the page. But what you're trying to do is you're trying to merge that beginner's mind attitude it's a spirit with the technical skills you've learned. The right. mas- so that's the mastery, right? That's like the, the repetition of the drawing. Like I, yeah. you know, so you're trying to like merge that child, like what children, it's funny. Like when you're dealing with kids, kids have everything that you don't have that you wish you still did. And you <laughs> have everything they want too. Yeah. So it's this yeah. thing where you're looking at your kids. I, I particularly felt this when they were five, four or five. I was like, you have everything I want and yet you want to be a big kid, yeah. but you have everything I want in this little, if I could just have your spirit and your attitude and my technique, yeah. like, you know, something well, could pa- really happen. Doesn't here. Picasso say something about, I took a lifetime to learn to draw like a child again. Yeah. And, yeah. and lots of artists have, and you're yeah. really getting to, so you're, you're, you're kind of sussing out what my next book <laughs> is like what right. I've been desperately trying for the half decade to do yeah. is there's, I think there's a, um, what I've told people is 
children can just teach us way more than we can teach them. Mm -hmm. We get them for this very brief period in which they are kind of these raw scientists, artists types. And if we put them in the right positions, if we put them in the right environment, they can teach us just like wondrous things. Yeah. But usually what we do is we put them in like a kind of shitty pre-adult like school environment, (laughs) Yeah. you know, which is like the opposite of like what, what what is really it's that where that uptightedness begins in our lives you know and um so yeah i'm just like but you know it's been like profound for me like being uh what i really wanted to do what i really want to do is just have a book that i can give you that's like um bottled energy of what it was like to watch my four-year-old draw Mm. i just i'm trying to figure out like in a book form like how can I like give you, how can you like open the book and get the whiff of the fumes of that yeah, yeah. experience? Like what the energy, the magic, also the misery and the mayhem yeah. of that moment. Because like one of the things I realized with my kids is like people talk about child's play. And when I would watch my kids draw, I mean, they would really struggle sometimes. I mean, there'd be like a real tension yeah. and like a, you know, Intensity and they get frustrated yeah. and stuff. I mean, they really were, they're just such like, my guys were little cavemen, you know, like carving <laughs> on the wall. It was like so cool to watch, you know. Yeah. Um, and I have, I have boys, I, don't, I didn't get a daughter, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, I, I always, I was born one, but um, yeah, so they're just like these little me cave (laughs) but um yeah so i'm just trying to like uh i think that's what we all like i really think that that uh you know picasso also said that you know all children are artists the problem is just how do you remain one when you grow up and that's you know an epigraph if i ever heard one it's like one of the great what I want to position is not that I think people should have kids because I don't think they should. Right. <laughs> but that's another thing about me is I, yeah. I, I'm a, I'm a very agnostic about parenting, but I do think that being around young people, yeah. especially really little ones gets us back to that kind of, it's a chance for us to kind of reconnect with that right. five-year-old in us that still yeah. resides. Cause I know mine's still in there. He's still <laughs> like, he's still scribbling with crayons on his yeah. mom's kitchen table, you know. Austin, like, what's some? <laughs> how do you, or, or do you experience boredom, and is it useful, or is yeah. it not really something that crosses your crosses your work table? Oh uh, yeah, I get terribly bored, um, particularly with reading. I have trouble yeah. with, uh, you know, and I get tr- bored with my work too. I think boredom is just a. It's like pain. It's just a signal that something is wrong or something's like not right. I think it's a great springboard. Right. Um, I think that it's usually, a, it's, you know, there's a couple of things like it's, it's powerful in different ways. For one, one thing when you can, if you can be real with yourself and say, I'm bored with this, then you can like really say, okay, well, what, what do I do now? What's <laughs> playful? You know, what's right. whatever. But the other thing you can do is you can bore yourself into working. And that's really powerful. That's more powerful. You know, there's existential boredom, which isn't, which is like upsetting and actually leads to less work. You know, you have to really fight with that. Yeah. But there's cultivated boredom, (laughs) which is I'm going to sit at this table or I'm going to sit on this airplane chair and I'm not going to have a phone or a Wi Fi or whatever. And I can either sit here or stare at the wall. Yeah. Or I can make something. Right. Always works. <laughs> like always an airplane works. seat. Yeah. If I have my notebook and yeah. I'm on an airplane and I have it and there's no Wi Fi. Yeah, I know. There's always, always, always I will get good stuff. And another yeah. thing I love to be do on an airplane, which I don't understand what it is about airplanes. I think it's just <laughs> that you're like in this and you don't want to like <laughs> yeah exactly. you know you're like in the seat you're, you're buckled in, in you're like, like three you, by three by six you know, foot box and you're, and you're like, like I, yeah I, yeah I, I think there's something about like well i might as well go within yeah. <laughs> you know like i might as well like i'm i'm literally trying to crawl inside myself yeah. my, you know? small, so, my small team is terrified every time i get on a plane because I, I, I come back going I've had some ideas and they're like, of course you have. <laughs> yeah, of course you have. You've been on an airplane. I yeah. find that it doesn't even, I don't even need the airplane ride. As far as yeah. clarity goes, 
I just need the plane to take off. And the minute the plane takes off, I know how to do everything right. that I left behind. I know what <laughs> whatever the problem was behind yeah. has been thrown into relief. My my big um my big thing about travel is um it's wordplay, but I think it works, is that travel doesn't relieve your problems. It right. throws them into relief. As in, right. whatever your problem is, when you travel, you figure it out. Like yeah. you kind of get clarity on the problem at least. And that's what works for me. But th- that that cultivated boredom I find really helpful. The, the existential boredom is just really difficult. That's like, how many more newsletters can I do? Yeah. But yeah. I love the blank page of the newsletter. I love the deadline. I yeah. love... Thursday, Monday and Thursday are my best days around here. And my, my right. Meg would tell you that yeah. because Monday is like, I got nothing on the calendar. This is the great privilege of my life, right? Yeah. Is that this is the work. So like Monday, I've got nothing on the calendar. The whole point of the day is you got to have something good for these people, right? You got to have something good for your crew. You got to bring something. And what's bothering you? What's around? Sometimes yeah. it's like, what are your cool images? Like right. I built whole newsletters just off of you images, have, right? Yeah. Well, well, I want to use this image. What what goes next to it? Where do I go from here? Yeah, you know. And then Thursday is like, oh, Thursday is like the best day ever because <laughs> it's like I get to just talk about anything other than my like I get to right. point outwards. Yeah, you're like right. Hey, here are the 10 things. Here's yeah. the 10 things. And it's yeah. so, it's like the 10 commandments. What should go on there? <laughs> Everyone so asks me like, why are you listed 10? I'm like, well, I don't work for Moses. Like, who <laughs> yeah, cares? Exactly. You know? <laughs> like, no, but it's like, you know, those are the, my favorite days actually. Yeah. Friday is really difficult for me. And everyone's like, Friday is difficult for me. I'm like, yeah, I've sent this thing out. And like, yeah. and sometimes people are angry. You know, sometimes right. they'll say something they're mad about or, or, I don't know. There's just like a letdown on Friday. So I have to right. really be careful about Fridays and Tuesday. Tuesday is usually date day. My yeah. wife and I usually do something fun. I'll go in the studio and stuff. But but those are like my best days. Nice. And that's been a real revelation to me too, is that I love to work. Like yeah. I like working. Yeah. And so much of my, I, you know, it's been five years since I did a book and I feel deeply troubled by that. You know, like yeah. I, But I also, and I've started having dreams where I'm back at one of my old day jobs and the dream is that they're going to find out that I haven't done anything this week. Like that's (laughs) the revealing. What could that possibly be about? What could that possibly be about, right? (laughs) But um, one of the funny things about books and I is that sometimes I I hold books at arm's length because I'm like scared of doing them and I'm like, Ugh, I'd rather do anything other than write a book. But if I kind of wait long enough, all this space junk kind of orbits me long enough that like yeah. smashes into each other. Totally. And it totally. just like, it suddenly becomes clear that it's like, this is it. Yeah. And it's like a big boulder in your path. And if you don't do it, it's just going to sit there like a blockage. You a know? metaphor somebody gave me many years ago was, um, it's like, imagine this whole process is you swimming underwater and the longer you can hold your breath, the more interesting a place it is that you pop up. Oh, I like that. And I just like that, um, yeah. that you know, that kind of the your lungs straining at the ambiguity of it all. It's just like I just want to, damn it, I just want to do something to kind yeah. of end this and, and get something done. But, but like... you can just sit with it longer. You pop up somewhere a little further downstream, and you have got a different perspective, and you've traveled a bit further, and you collected more stuff, and you got I love more it. wisdom. Yeah. yeah. You've nailed it. I mean, that's the way I feel is it's just like, you know, what, yeah. what, whose time frame are you on to? Yeah, it's like, like it, it's stuff is ripening. Yeah. And it's it's like, ripe. Why, why it's, would you pluck the peach before it's ripe? Yeah. I mean, it's, I love that. Like why, yeah. why you got to let the fruit ripe, you yeah. know, ripen. Yeah. yeah. That's really good. And again, that's another natural metaphor. Like yeah. the, the, you can think about churning out another book like a factory or you can think about like well is this crop in like have i cross-pollinated the you know again exactly. it's the gardening thing hey austin obviously we i could keep talking to you for about another <laughs> seven hours but for the interest of my my, my listeners i'm going to ask you one final question which is what needs to be said that hasn't yet been said between you and me uh, um Oh, I, I like talking to you. I'm glad we're friends. <laughs> Me too. I think I really enjoyed when you came to the studio and Me too. Yeah. Um I'm I, and we went to that great Being yeah. Dead show. That's right. At end of an ear. 
Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I had a very I, cool Austin moment for me. I, an Austin, yeah. an Austin moment. Yeah. I think I would just circle back to something that we talked about earlier, which is, you know, I remember years ago, I had a South by Southwest panel that I put together. And I used to, in the early days, I would use that as a way to just hang out with people I wanted to hang out with. Right. And um, I had my friend Jessica Hagee was there. She's Maris brilliant. Kreitzman was there. Drew yeah. Gernovich, who's a New Yorker cartoonist. And we talked about captions and pictures and words. Mm. We were sitting at Franklin Barbecue <laughs> back when you could get a table. And, um, and I looked around and I, I said to them, I said, what do you think the best thing is about what we do? And they were kind of like, oh, great. What's awesome to say? I was like, <laughs> and I pointed around the table in the circle. And I said this. This yeah. is the best thing. This was my dream. When I was just a kid in the cornfield, right. I just wanted to meet people who cared about the same things that I did. And I got him. Voila. <laughs> Amazing. You know? And that's that's what I would say. It's just like, you know. And I also think that I'm very jealous of you for having like a podcast because I think this is such a wonderful format and it's such a nice way to have friends. I couldn't be happier that this was the interview that kicked off our rebooted two pages with MBS. You can probably tell I found the whole conversation an utter delight. And honestly, it could have probably been a four hour epic. Do you remember Austin saying earlier on, I try to approach things more like a gardener with a light comedic spirit. I want to remember that. One of my life rules, here harking back to that intro, comes from a Rilke poem, The Man Watching, and these lines in particular, his growth is to be the deeply defeated by ever greater things. I mean, I love that, to be deeply defeated by ever greater things. But also, honestly, it does nudge me a little towards capital S serious. I can get a little tragic about it, you know, the tortured hero. Now, I'm seeing the power of combining Gardner and Lightness from Austin, plus my real mantra. Hold it lightly, Michael. Be in the mess. Have some fun. Now, you'll find Austin at austincleon.com and, you know, with his socials connected to all of that, but I'd really encourage you to subscribe to his newsletter, which is fabulous. Um, his books you'll find in all the usual places. And if you enjoyed my conversation with Austin, and if you're listening to this, I know that you did, and let me recommend two earlier interviews with two brilliant women who both happen to be called Jessica. Number 38 is called How to Keep Creating with Jessica Hagee. Now, Jessica's illustrations have been favorites of mine for about 15 years, I think. And in fact, I've hired her to illustrate a journal I'm publishing in 2025. And Jessica reads from a fabulous true tale, A Stranger in the Woods, the extraordinary story of the last true hermit by Michael Finkel. Number 49 is How to Survive Being Creative with Jessica Abel, another wonderful illustrator. She read from a book that was new to me, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, Essays by Alexander Chi. Also a really rich conversation. Now you can support the podcast by signing up for the Substack newsletter, joining as a paid member if you'd like the cool bonuses, recommending episodes you love to people you like, and leaving a review if you're so moved. Doing one of those things would be lovely. Doing more than one would be thoroughly delightful. And as I love to say, you're awesome and you're doing great. <laughs>